You're listening to TIP. On today's show, I chat with real estate investor and entrepreneur David Friedman to talk about the basics of turning your home into a cash flowing rental property. David is a co founder and CEO of Knox Financial, which he founded after a very successful exit from another tech company that he had previously founded. What we cover in today's episode is something that I'm actually doing myself currently. And it's a strategy that I think is a great way for people to get started with rental properties if they're looking for a low down payment option and don't want a house hack. So without further delay, let's get right into this week's episode with David Friedman. You're listening to Real Estate Investing by the Investors Podcast Network, where your host, Robert Leonard, interviews successful investors from various real estate investing niches to help educate you on your real estate investing journey. Hey, everyone. Welcome to this week's episode of the Real Estate Investing Podcast. As always, I'm your host, Robert Leonard. And with me today, I have David Friedman. Welcome to the show, David. Thanks. Great to be here. Before we dive into the main topic for today's show, tell us a bit about yourself and how you got to where you are today. I'm a guy who's been in fintech and real estate tech most of my career. I grew up in New York and uh, moved to Boston for college and grad school. And then about 16 years ago, I launched my first tech company, which was a software company building software for real estate brokerages. So that was my entree into the real estate tech world. I ran that company for a dozen years and sold it to a private equity firm in 2016. So that, that was a pretty successful arc for everybody around. And while we were doing that, I really got deep experience in the data side of real estate and the real estate market, a bunch of adjacent industries, mortgage, insurance, et cetera. And from that experience and a bunch of the data work we did, one of the senior executives there, Spencer, and I uh, teamed up after that sale to launch Knox, which is my current company. So that's sort of the quick and dirty on my career. So today, we're going to dive into how people can turn their primary residence into an investment property. You mentioned Knox Financial. I know that's what you guys are doing with your company now. And it's a strategy that I actually recommend to a lot of people for them to do it themselves before I heard about what you're doing with Knox. So please explain what it means to turn a primary residence into an investment property and why this might even be a good idea. So I'll tell a personal story, and it's part of the reason Knox exists. So I lived in a condo in the south end of Boston for 10 years. It was the first home I ever bought. When I bought it, I put $100,000 down on a $500,000 property. And, and gosh, you know, I had some of the best times in my 20s in that condo. <laughs> it was a two bed, one bath, and I had great roommates along the way. And eventually I met my wife and we didn't fit into it. We had too much stuff between the two of us. So we decided we'd go buy a home. And we did. And I went to put that home on the market. And I looked at the return I was about to make on this investment, which was my home for 10 years. And I said, this is my best investment. Why would I sell my best investment? What kind of an investing idiot sells their best investment? And not only that, but at the time I had every bit of confidence that that property was going to continue to appreciate. And I started to think about all the things I had to do in order to turn that home into an investment. And it gave me a headache. And by the way, as I mentioned a moment ago, I was running a real estate tech company at the time. And I talked to realtors and people in the real estate world every day. So I knew how to do it. It's just such a headache. So I sold it. Four years later, the new owners sold the home for $200,000 more than I had sold it to them for. And I looked at that. I said, oh my God, somebody stole $200,000 from me. That's my money. What was younger me stealing from older me, <laughs> younger, more naive David. And so I told this story to all sorts of people and almost everybody had the same story. And the older they were, the more their response to me was something like, listen, kid, I owned this home in Brooklyn in 84 and I sold it for a quarter million bucks. I thought I was stealing money from the buyer. It's worth 3 million now. So your little $200,000 is, is chump change. So the answer is that everybody looks back at their first home and says, well, geez, if I'd held that today, my standard of living would be different. I'd be in a different tax bracket. So it's an obvious opportunity. And uh, more people took advantage of it. You know, There'd be a lot more wealth creation. When might it not be a good idea? What are some of the downsides of this strategy? Not every property is meant to be an investment property. And my favorite example of this is on the street where I live, 
there are three bedroom homes that you can buy for about a million dollars. And then that might sound expensive in a lot of markets, but this is like a downtown top 10 city in the US. Things are expensive, just it's the way it is. There are also three bedroom homes you can buy for $3 million on that street. Now, the way the market prices both or each of those properties as a rental, you do not get triple the rent for the $3 million property that you do for the million dollar property. So it's very hard to make that $3 million three bedroom a good investment. Now that million dollar three bed is a fantastic investment and the numbers work incredibly well. So you got to run the numbers and make sure that they line up for you and help you meet your investment goals. So on your website, you have three different scenarios. Somebody who's moving, someone who's retiring, and someone who's a landlord. What happens if someone is moving or retiring and they need that lump sum of cash that they likely get when they sold their property? This is often the largest objection I hear from people. And it's one that I even faced myself when I was just getting started. So how do you overcome that? And how can you deal with this problem? Well, the first question is, how much cash do they need? If they need every dime of equity they've got in that home, then it's going to be very hard to hold that property as an investment. The data shows that that is not the case for the majority of families. The data shows that the majority of families own enough equity in their home and a significant percentage of them also own other investments and they can hold on to that property. The math does work. Now, that's not true for everybody. And therefore, for Knox, we can't work with 100% of the population and that's okay. So again, you have to ask this question, what's the investment outcome I want? And if the outcome is I need a big lump sum of cash now, and it's equal to all or close to all the equity, you're probably best off selling. So if they don't need all of it, but they need a good portion of it, say maybe half, what can they do to go about that? The simple thing to do is to refinance their mortgage if they have one or get a mortgage if they don't have one right now, or sometimes it's a second mortgage. We offer all those products. The reality is a lot of people, especially if you're in like the retiring profile, you've owned a home for decades and you've built a lot of equity. And it's incredibly likely you can do a refinance of that property if you need cash and pull out what you need to either put a down payment on the next home or have some cash to put into some kind of fixed income vehicle that helps support your lifestyle. But really the home itself can be that fixed income vehicle. And that is the investment that a lot of your retiring folks are looking for. Something that not only provides income, but also provides principal value growth at the same time. That's a very hard investment to find. And a residential property can offer that. So if there's someone who has owned a property for a year, two years, maybe three years, and they've seen the value of their property go up a bit, but maybe not enough to make that refinance really worthwhile when you take into consideration all the different aspects that go into a refinance, is there no real other option for them if they can't refinance and they need that capital for their next property? When you've only owned a home for two or three years, it is tough. Unless you're in some very specific growth markets like San Francisco or Manhattan, it is tough. You'd have to be in one of a few situations. Either you're not going to buy, you're going to rent wherever you're going, or you have other capital saved up, maybe from your paycheck or any number of other scenarios. One of my favorites, we see this a lot. There'll be an individual who's owned a home for one or two years and they get engaged to another individual who's owned a home for a while. We'll actually do an analysis of each property and we'll say, we think the better investment is to hold on to this one. So they sell one versus the other and that sale is their down payment for the home they're both moving into and they keep one of them. We've also had the situation where two people are getting married and they've each owned a home for a dozen years and they're in just like this great position. They're going to have a little portfolio of property and they're going to buy a new home. We do see that. So how about somebody who maybe has enough equity, but when they refinance now, because of the higher loan amount, their monthly payment has increased. And so now it doesn't really make sense as an investment. Maybe it's negative cash flow. The return numbers just really aren't good. So it's not really worth it. What are their choices? So there's math you can run. And this is something we do for people all the time. It's actually a button in our software we can run for people, which is what is the maximum refi I can do and still be cash flow positive? So you can figure out what that is and say, all right, is this enough money for me to have the cash I need for the next stage in life? Now, negative cash flow is not necessarily a problem. 
if you've got a property that's growing in value by thirty thousand dollars a year and it's costing you three grand a year in cash flow, that's an investment a lot of people would like. I would happily pay you three thousand dollars a year for an investment that's going up in value thirty thousand dollars a year. That's an easy trade-off, right? So you might look at your income and say, "Do I have three hundred dollars a month to continue this example to cover that loss, that cash loss?" Now, that same property is very likely paying down the mortgage to the tune of about $300 a month. So on, you know, the cash is not in your wallet and you can't use it to go to the movies. Not like anybody's going to the movies right now anyway, but you know what I mean? But what you're really doing is it's coming out of your pocket. It's going to pay down your mortgage. Another option in this case is to look at different types of mortgages. So sometimes your five and 10 year notes have lower interest rates and interest only product is also super interesting. Right now, you can find 10-year interest-only rates that are really low. And again, you're not writing that principal amount every month. So maybe you keep that mortgage for five or seven years, and the rent creeps up maybe 2 or 3% a year. Five years from now, you do a real bigger refi with more rent on the place. And then you get in a 30-year note that you're going to hold for a long period of time. So you can cut your expenses by not paying principal for a few years. Do you recommend that people... And specifically investors take on or hold the property with negative cash flow and you know making that up with appreciation because I hear from a lot of investors that that's not necessarily a great strategy to implement so I'm curious your opinion on that I think it's a great strategy for the right property and for the right owner we are very much a long investment company so not paying principal is a little risky if you're not planning on holding that investment for a long period of time. It, it does add a layer of risk, you might say. Now, I could also argue that there's no difference between that risk and taking that exact same note and then every month putting a few hundred dollars in a bank account, right? There's no difference. And I'm a big fan of that strategy because I could not just put it in a bank account, but I could put it in some kind of an investment vehicle, even a T-bill that pays me some amount of money as opposed to having the bank hold that principal, and then it made me no money. So I don't consider it super risky, but what I think is risky is trying to make a real estate investment and assuming a short timeline. If you are in that mover profile, as you mentioned on our website, with people who are moving, and we generally consider those folks earlier in their lives. So you're moving for any given reason. Maybe you're getting married, you're having a kid, you've got a new job, you name it. And you want to hold on to that property, you're not going to retire. You're not going to need access to that investment for decades. And that's how you should be thinking about your strategy. Not, I'm going to hold this home for three or four or five years most of the time. Now, if I might add one more thing, there are lots of folks who call us and say, I can't, you know, nobody's making offers on my property for what I think it's worth. My realtor wants me to make another price reduction. And I think even though it's going to be negative cash flow for me, I'm going to make an extra fifty or hundred thousand dollars when I sell it when the market looks better. Now, in that strategy, a little bit of negative cash flow would be a fine thing. So, how does this strategy that we've been talking about work with a house hack of a two, three, or even four unit property? It works very similarly. What we see is two scenarios. One is You'll have a, a young person or a young couple who buys a two or three family. They live in it for a while. And basically, the other unit or two pays their living costs. So they're kind of living there for free, but they're not really making money. And maybe they're living in a one or two bedroom unit. Now they have a child, maybe two, and it's time to move to a single family and a yard and a garage and all the nice things, right? And I say, all right, now I'm going to move out of this home. But by the way, this is a working couple, right? So they don't want the full-time job or a job on top of their full-time job. So they say, hey, Knox, would you take over this property for us? So they're moving out of there and they've had net zero living expenses for the entire time they've been there. And they've been saving up for a down payment on their forever house, if you will. And this is multifamily has been their starter home. The other scenario, we get a lot of people who have small real estate portfolios, call it one or two or three properties. And a lot of them are multifamilies. It works out very similarly. It's just you've got multiple rents coming in and your expenses are on the overall building, obviously. So let's assume someone decides they do want to give this strategy a try. 
give us the five-step checklist needed to turn their home into a rental property. Step one would be do the math. So pull out your favorite spreadsheet software and figure out your costs. So what is your debt cost you every month? What are your taxes? What's your insurance? Do you have a condo fee? Bear in mind that your insurance is going to go up a little bit. And in a lot of states, your taxes are also going to go up. States like Massachusetts and Vermont have a different tax rate for primary residences than they do for buildings that are rented out. So you have to know what the tax rate is going to be. In places like Vermont, it goes up three to four X. It's unbelievable. So be aware of that and understand your carrying cost. The next part of the math step is figure out what you think you can get for rent. And you don't want to just punch into Zillow. You're going to have to go and find rentals that are similar. Zillow's rental price algorithm is not terrible, but it's not very good either. They're basically doing a derivative on their home valuation, and that's not necessarily accurate. So you got to go find similar rentals that are in the area, find a dozen of them, and take a look at the photos. Decide, is your home similar? Is it nicer? Et cetera. Okay? So now figure out what your profitability looks like. And then if you're going to do a refi, figure out what your new debt cost, your cost of capital. So that's bullet one. Bullet two is to figure out how do I want to run this thing? Am I going to be a DIY property investor or am I going to be the type of property investor who outsources to third parties? If you're going to do that, try to find a bunch of vendors. Now, if you're going to work with Knox, we're all those vendors in one. So that said, you're probably going to need somebody to do maintenance. You're going to need somebody to find you a tenant. You need somebody to collect rent. Sometimes that's the same person who does maintenance. You probably need a lawyer to draw up, draw up a lease. If you're going to do a refi, you need a mortgage broker. You're going to need to call an insurance company to get the right insurance policy. And hopefully you've got an accountant who can figure out your taxes. And that's just like the first four or five vendors. You got to have your stash of people who's going to help you do this. If you are going to outsource it all, go and figure out your pricing and redo your math at step one. Figure out what you know, your return really looks like. And then figure out a timeline. So the next step is, when am I moving out? Where am I moving to? And by when can I have a, a tenant in the home paying rent, right? And then work with those vendors. Or if you're doing it yourself, start marketing the home for rent. You know, Put it on Craigslist, put it everywhere else you, you want to put it on Zillow, et cetera. And start marketing the home for rent for a uh, can see that date. And then there's a lot of little things here, but you, know, you got to give the tenants a lease. Definitely want to run a background check on the tenants. Call the prior landlords. You're going to have to collect security deposit. You're going to have to figure out how to keep that security deposit in a proper escrow account because there's laws and things you got to do around that. So there's a lot to figure out there. And then move on out. Make sure you know exactly what condition your home is in when you move out. So when somebody moves in and then a few years later they move out, you can walk around and say, well, that crack in that wall wasn't there and that piece of glass was there and that light fixture had a cover on it, that kind of thing. And and that's about it. And last thing, this thing is you got to have a backup, right? Owning income property requires all those vendors and a neighbor who's willing to like back you up when you're on vacation. If you've got that, if you've got you know, a parent or a brother or somebody who's a few miles away who can back you up on it, that's a blessing. So when someone's implementing this strategy, what are the most important things to look out for? That's a great question. I think that the first thing to look out for, I mean, the quality of tenant is so important. Maybe the worst shortcut people take is in not properly vetting tenants. For 15 or 20 bucks, you punch in some information into a system and it gives you everything from their credit to their employment history and everything else. There's a million services out there and they're not that expensive. They're totally worth it. And don't skip the steps. Call their prior landlords. Make sure they were good people. They paid rent on time, et cetera. The other mistake I see people doing is thinking their home is exactly as it should be when they move out. They miss out on income opportunities. One of my favorite moves is we'll walk into a home and we'll say, oh, if you put up a wall here, wall and a door, that's a bedroom. And so the way you lived in your home might not be the optimal way to rent your home. So think about that. You might have a big, beautiful driveway and there's the opportunities to rent more parking space. So think about how you optimize the income from the home, that's a mistake we see all the time. We take over portfolios. We often find hundreds or thousands of dollars a month in this income opportunity in, in the portfolio. With this type of strategy, how does one calculate their expected cash flow and return numbers? How does it differ from a typical rental property? Cash flow is the math we were talking about earlier. It's your rent minus your expenses. And then you can assume some rate of maintenance. Now, depending on the age of your property and the type of property, is it a condo? Is it in 
it's another type of association where an HOA, where there, there's certain shared expenses. So that might affect your math. But net cash flow is not hard to do. It's your rent minus your expenses, you know, your debt, your taxes, your insurance, maybe a condo fee, and then some assumed maintenance. That's not hard. But really where your ROI on a property is found is in the value growth of the property. Now, what you find interestingly is those two modulate one another. So in markets where properties don't appreciate as much, you will generally find more net cash flow from rental property there. That's because investors are not going to put their capital to work in those markets without one balancing out the other. It just won't happen. So that actually drops the the price of the units down in those markets, and they're not going to appreciate quite as much. Now, if you're going to buy a unit and you don't care where it is geographically and you want cash flow, the Midwest is really nice. You'll see some really nice cash on cash returns out there. Now, if you're looking for value growth, you're going to want to be in growing cities. And that's really where you often get your highest compound growth rates and, and return on investment because you might buy a property for half a million dollars and put $100,000 down when the property is going up in value by $25,000 a year. So just the value growth on that $100,000 investment is going up 25% per year. And that's an absolutely outstanding investment by any yardstick. So it seems throughout this conversation that a lot of the success in this strategy is dependent on strong appreciation in value. So is this strategy only possible on the coast, which is where you really see that appreciation? Or can you do this successfully and when I say successfully, I also mean, is it worthwhile in, say, a Midwest market where you typically don't see that strong appreciation, but you see stronger rents? I was mentioning this. So in the Midwest, you'll actually find sometimes you do get 20 or 25% cash on cash returns. You might put $25,000 down on a $100,000 unit that does spit out five grand in net cash flow a year. That is not impossible math in Columbus. So it's not a bad strategy. I didn't mean to say it was all about the value growth, especially for folks who want cash flow. Then you want to do run the numbers and say, okay, do I get the cash flow I'm looking for? A huge percentage of the homes that come in our program, that's the goal. Especially for folks who are, say, on the the back nine, if you will, of life. And they're looking to either retire or they're empty nesting and downsizing, moving into a smaller property in the city or what have you. There's all these life scenarios where people say, you know what, I'm going to slow down. I'm not going to work as hard. You name it. And in a few years or as soon as possible, maybe I want my passive investments to support a certain level of lifestyle. And that's a, that's a broader picture because usually it involves a number of investments. In fact, it always should. But a real estate can be an incredible investment in that uh, calculus. Well, it's also really interesting about this strategy. And one of the reasons why I like it is because you can get into it with three and a half, five percent down. So even if you're talking about some expensive programs or expensive properties, that can still be pretty, you know, a low down payment in comparison to what you'd have to put into if it was 20, 25 percent, like a traditional rental or investment property would be. So you can do the strategy technically every year. And to your point, you can't refinance. So you're not gonna be able to get all your capital back out. But because your down payment is so much lower, if you buy one for 3.5%, maybe you're able to save some more because instead of putting 20% down, you save that extra 17% or so, 16.5%. So you buy one, live in it for a year, and then move out, buy another one for 3.5% or 5%, and then you can continue to snowball it. One of our earliest customers is this incredibly... I don't know if he's smart or lucky or both, fellow who... Those low down payment loans are HUD loans, right? So he and his wife bought a two-family in Massachusetts and about a year into their ownership, they put 5% down. Just like, like, I wish I had been able to do this when I was buying my first home. Maybe I could have, but I didn't know. But 5% down, a year later, his wife gets a new job in Utah. And the ROI, the day they put that home in our program was 51% because he only put 5% down. It's unbelievable. And sure enough, his wife had gotten like a signing bonus for the new job. And they actually went and did it again. Like you said, on a home in Utah, and they were a young couple with their young baby. I can only imagine that at some point in the next few years, they'll move into a nicer, bigger house in Utah and do it again. And they're going to start building this portfolio. It's a brilliant strategy, like you said. Yeah, I think it's a great strategy for new investors to get started. So I think this deep dive into the topic is going to be helpful for a lot of people. Like I said, it's one that I used when I was first getting started. 
It's actually one that I'm going to do right now. I have a property that I own and I'm moving over the next few months. I'm going to be buying another property rather than selling it. I'm turning it into a rental. I kind of went into it knowing that. So it's not a big surprise, but nonetheless, I'm still doing the same exact strategy and I'm actually going to buy a house hack. So I'm continuing on with the same low down payment type investing. So I think this conversation is going to be really good, really helpful for a lot of people that are trying to get into real estate with a relatively small amount of capital upfront. If someone wants to connect with you after this episode, where can they go to find you? Well, the, the easiest way to find us and make all of this, what sounds like a lot of work and not a lot of work, that's what Knox Financial does. We make this frictionless experience. And you can check out knoxfinancial.com and inquire. If you want to talk to me, just say, hey, I heard Dave on the podcast. I'd love to chat with Dave. And that message will definitely find its way to me. Awesome. I'll be sure to put a link to Knox Financial's website and all the resources you have on, on the site in the show notes so everybody listening today can go check it out. David, thanks so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you. This has been great. All right, guys. That's all I had for this week's episode of Real Estate Investing. I'll see you again next week. Thank you for listening to TIP. To access our show notes, courses, or forums, go to theinvestorspodcast.com. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Before making any decisions, consult a professional. This show is copyrighted by the Investors Podcast Network. Written permissions must be granted before syndication or rebroadcasting.